It's another episode of the Christian Reeve podcast. But before we get into it, are you subscribed? If not, please make sure to subscribe, like and share the video and spread the word. Because the Christian Reeve podcast is here to stay. I love doing this and I love all of you that support me. So thank you. And yeah, let's get into this podcast, shall we? Boom. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Christian Reef podcast. Today's guest is host of the Wild Nights with Rocky Powell podcast. She hails all the way from New York City. Welcome to the show, Rocky Powell. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Christian. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, yeah, let's jump straight in, into the podcast. Uh, you've just began this podcast, as I understand, and uh, right. it's, it's a pretty unique idea. You know, I mean, I see a lot of podcasts naturally, and um, I tend to favor the ones that have more of a clear structure, like, you know, and I think right. they tend to do better in general. Like if you have a niche or a particular format, you're going to do better than if it's just conversational and it's all over the place, because uh-huh. obviously your your audience... Um, you're, you're going to build an audience based on people being able to follow a sort of a natural progression or, or a format. And with your format, it's basically uh, you interviewing people in a, in a kind of more, in a for, like a less formal situation, but like you're basically talking about some of the wildest nights they've had out, which I thought was really cool. Uh, especially, you Thank know, you. if it's people you know in New York, I mean, it's one of the biggest cities in the world. Uh, so how did you come up with this idea? Um, well... I used to party a lot. I used to have a lot of fun. Um, I am a Canadian in New York and it would, yeah, it would not be out of the regular for us to go out on like a Wednesday night and just rage, have a good time. Friday nights, like everyone I, everyone I associate with is usually down for a good time. So when the pandemic happened, it just kind of, halted everything as everyone in the world knows you know you can't go out anymore you can't do anything and I missed talking to comedians I missed talking to entertainers and I had wanted to start a podcast for about a year and a half before that Mm -hmm. so I just finally said well this thing doesn't look like it's ending anytime soon (laughs) nobody's taking it seriously I have the time right now to do it so let me start this podcast so I started emailing some friends that I knew that were comedians and telling them the concept of it. And yeah, I was able to get some interviews and then I started reaching out to kind of people I didn't know. So um, radio hosts across the country, other people on um, just, you know, musicians and stuff, people, people, drag queens, people in the entertainment industry that I knew would probably have a great story to tell. So I tell all my guests beforehand to give me one word to describe their story. And that's all I know about the story. And oh, then wow. I, yeah. And, and then I let them come on and tell the story. Um, and I just say, okay, this is the word that they gave me. And then they come on and tell the story. And sometimes, you know, they're a little bit more tame Mm-hmm. They're not as, you know, they're not drug filled, sex filled, you know, bender. They're just an interesting night. Um, and sometimes they're off the rails. But I always tell the people, I trust you as an entertainer to tell a great story. So if this is a wild night to you, then it fits under the umbrella of the show. I gotta ask, have you had anyone on the show so far who like came and maybe like the story was a bit boring or not what you expected or something? <laughs> um, so I've had seven episodes so far and then I okay. have six, I have six episodes recorded that haven't been edited yet. Six mm. or seven um, that haven't been, I know. That's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I've been starting to edit earlier and earlier in the week. That's why I'm glad I have a few in the can because then they come out on Mondays. On Sundays, I at the beginning, I was up till two in the morning editing and I said, I can't do this. I have to yeah. come up with a better strategy. So um, nobody, luckily, no one has told a boring story yet. I've had a couple stories that were a little shorter and okay. a little more rated PG. Mm-hmm. But the person who had the people who've told those stories have always um they've always delivered with details and everything. And Mm -hmm. I do the first few minutes of the podcast is me speaking. 
Yeah. Um, so without the guest. So yeah, I've been fortunate that I've had pretty entertaining stories. And now I'm in a position where I have so many t- stories recorded that um, I don't, if I feel like a story is not good, I could probably not use it, but I haven't had to do that yet. I just want to say, this is a side note as well, because um, I listened to one of your episodes yeah. and and I, I, I don't know if th- <sighs> this is kind of like maybe advice or maybe like a suggestion, but I just wanted to throw it your way because uh-huh. I sort of put it on in the background and basically what I do with my research with every guest is I sit down and I mm-hmm. go through everything and I, I build up a kind of a profile of that person. And of course. Sort of, yeah, 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 yeah. Think about different things I want to ask them. And uh, I was listening to it and I was, I was really getting into it. And um, y- it hadn't even gotten to the interview part yet. It was just you talking like some funny story. I think it was something to do with um, speed dating or something like that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I was just sitting there laughing and I was like, I, I really think you should do maybe just like some standalone episodes where you just like talk like funny stories about from your life. Cause seriously, like it was actually really, really entertaining. And now that you've told thank me you're you. a comedian, it makes perfect sense. Cause of the way that oh, you structured it as you. well. It's like this, you know, because there's one thing telling a funny story. Um, and, and this is the thing, like over the years, people have said like to me, like, why don't you try stand up comedy? And I'm like, uh-huh. because there's a difference between being funny, making a joke and then being a comedian, which is like, you have to have so much structure and planning involved in that. And it's, it's, it's just a whole other, you know, thing. In, in... Element. R- right. Exactly. Right. Um, but yeah, I really think you should, you should consider that because it was. Very <laughs> <entertaining>. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I, um, I think I'm gradually, especially with, like I said, I had some stories that are on the shorter side. I think I am probably gradually and um, eventually if I get picked up by a podcasting network, right. that would be that would be the ultimate goal. But just while I have a smaller audience, one of the perks of having people in the entertainment industry across the country on the podcast is they get to share it with their friends in different pockets of the United States, different pockets of Canada. So where I... I truly, really appreciate that compliment. And I do not take it lightly. I I thank you very much. I also know that just because I am new, I do have to kind of build with the, with the guests. So I, that's the only reason why I'm still doing it with guests and because I love talking to people, Mm -hmm. but eventually that would be, it would be amazing just to do a show on my own. I mean, the reason I suggest it is like, you know, I think um, for certain people, you know, when they do their podcast, they just want it one particular way and it doesn't deviate right. from that. Like for me, uh-huh. I actually started the podcast thinking I would do it like how I do the vlogs on my YouTube channel where I just talk uh-huh. on a topic because I'm able to just waffle on for ages and apparently that's entertaining. But um, quickly, I kind of realized like I need to kind of make this... Um, is it multifaceted? Is that the right word? Like uh, basically having lots of different elements to it. So that's where levels, yeah. That's where the guests factor came in, and I'm always working mm-hmm. on it. So I um I get where you're coming from as far as like building the format. I think that obviously does just take in the time. beginning, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so yeah, moving it forward, like, what are your goals and aspirations for this podcast? I would love to monetize it. Right okay. now, I work with different um etsy companies i try to work with big uh, small businesses to do because i am a voiceover actress i work with small businesses and i give them commercials in my podcast in exchange for cross promotion um because i don't have because my audience is on the smaller side at the moment i don't have larger businesses looking to work with me because they don't need me you know i need them they don't need me so no one's going to pay me to have a small audience listen to their commercials. So I work with audiences who are on my level where I'm at at podcasting, they are in their small business. Right. So I've been working with, I've worked with probably about since I started the podcast in early December, I think I've worked with about eight different Etsy businesses and I'm going to continue to do that. And so I'm meeting different people that way, which has been really cool. Eventually I would love to just be making a living from it. I really am enjoying it. And when the world goes back to whatever the new normal is, I was a waitress before this auditioning constantly. And I just don't want to go back to that world. 
I know exactly where you're coming from. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just on a side note, by the way, because I'm definitely going to circle back to all of this stuff. Like, Oh yeah, I'm I'm very thorough with with my research, and for those listening at home, um, I I, I don't want to take the moment to apologise because I had no idea that Rocky is a comedian or a voice actress. None of that information <laughs> is readily available from the links that I was looking at, and oh, I'm yeah. I'm very thorough, so I'm I'm quite surprised uh, to hear that. But we'll we'll circle back to that and um, sure, yeah, 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 focus on the podcast for now. Uh, <laughs> what what are your podcasting goals for 2021? My goal for 2021, I would like to have at least 2,000 followers on Instagram. I would like to be having about, um, I would like to have 500 downloads for the week per episode. So those, those, that's my two goals. And then I would love to be contacted by a podcasting network, but I made the personal choice that I'm not going to contact a podcasting network until I have about probably 5,000 followers. But if I get contacted before that, that would be great. And what's what's the the sort of why have you made that decision? Well, because I know it will be easier to get picked up by a podcasting network if I have a huge following. Mm. Um, and also, I think instead of right now, while I'm kind of fresh in the game, instead of reaching out to a podcasting network and being like, I'm a little guppy and I need you more than you need me. I would, I would like to see how much I can build um, on my own, how much of this I can do on my own while I have the time. Mm. So you, you know, kind of, so. You, okay. You want to have more of a, like a, more chips that you can put on the table and be like, okay, this is what I got. What do you have to offer me rather than be the one that's like, Hey, please support me. I need it. That kind of deal. Absolutely. And to have people so, uh, and this is just from what I've heard from people, yourself included, and I appreciate the compliment, but I have been getting very positive feedback Mm -hmm. from it. And I think people are pleasantly surprised because I am doing this on the, on my own with the help. My little brother helps me a little bit, but I, for the most part, doing it all on my own. I have been getting really positive and surprising feedback like someone's like you've never done a podcast before and this is the level that you're at that's a that's a great sign Mm. so I I would love to you know have people just know who I am through word of mouth because of like have my reputation kind of lead me there there does seem to be a lot of that in the in the podcasting uh say industry for a second but in, I know. The, in the community like f- for those who who aren't uh podcasters what i will say is there's a big reddit community that's actually where i found yes. yeah and um yeah it's it's the sort of thing where you know there's a lot of people there they're all trying to do they all have similar goals but um often the cases you know you, you appear on each other's podcast and that and but like everyone is trying to grow and get better and you can quickly kind of figure out who's gonna go far with this and who's not and i know how harsh that sounds but bear with me Uh, no no i agree with you i agree with you this and this is what i I was saying before about the formatting thing like sometimes um you'll come on a show and it has a very clear format it's very easy to follow and, uh, you know, you can tell, like, okay, this is a good podcast. But sometimes it's a bit of a mess or it's hard to follow. Like, I've been interviewed before and, uh, you know, I've, I've said that, I think I said this in the last episode or, or one of the last episodes that, you know, I'm a very expressive person. So I take yeah. time talking. And obviously, it's very frustrating getting cut off or, like, you know, being told to give a short answer or whatever. And it's, you really got to, like, adapt to your guest i think that's a real key kind of aspect of this podcasting thing right but um yeah i digress i'm, I'm losing my point here. <laughs> you get what you I'm were saying to. that you were saying the podcast community is very saturated it's kind of hard to come out of the muck of it yeah or stand out i think i think my my point is that you you got to kind of conduct yourself in a very professional manner and by doing so that leads you to uh, finding more and more guests. Like I've actually had people contact me out of the blue and it's mm-hmm. not been through Reddit or anything like that. It's just people going, Oh, Hey, um, you know, I'm interested in appearing on your show. Like interestingly, I've right. had some businesses contact me 
which is oh cool yeah it was it was interesting um it's and it's a it's a different approach you have to go with it as well like um because I'm not really into the idea of giving like free advertising for the most part. So like if I do have someone on my show and they're a business owner, we'll, 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 we'll plug their business, but like, you know, I want to get to know them and, and kind of their career and stuff. And, and that's the focal point. Cause you know, mm-hmm. it, it's the whole point of this is, is, is conversation. And um, you know, often the best parts of it, of these podcasts tend to be, when you get topics out of the blue things you weren't expecting as opposed to just plugging the same old stuff you know what i mean like no one really wants to hear that do they especially since it's a podcast you know absolutely yeah so um who are your sort of sources of inspiration in, in the podcasting sphere so i really like conan o'brien needs a friend that's probably one wow okay oh my goodness (laughs) he has a podcast that's you have to you could even start from the beginning that's something I kind of like to do with podcasts I'll always start from the beginning and kind of binge it as if it were a tv show to get the growth of it I originally got into podcasts uh, I listened to Anna Ferris's podcast Unqualified I was into that for a while and then when she lost her producer Sim Sarna the show kind of changed a little bit and I wasn't Mm. I wasn't as into it, even though I'm really into her. I just wasn't as into the podcast anymore. Um, but I did like her early episodes. So that's what kind of got me into it. Conan O'Brien needs a friend. It's hilarious. It's laugh out loud funny. I really enjoy Whitney Cummings podcast, especially if she has a great guest and Dak Shepard, armchair expert when he has a really great guest, Joe Rogan, Because Joe Rogan and Dak Shepard, they, and Whitney Cummings, they tend to have longer episodes. Sometimes they go about two hours. Yeah. So it really has to be a guest where you're like, okay, I'm in this to win this, you know? I think it depends though. I mean, Mm -hmm. I I, I model my show a lot after Joe Rogan because I think that his approach, his format is something that I really like. Like, I mean, he, he's... He's very good, and I don't think he does, he needs. I mean, I don't know if he does research beforehand, but um, I think probably his producer does. Yeah, I, yeah, I would figure the same thing. Um, but when you watch the show, it's very much like sort of a long form chat show, essentially. Uh, whereas with with me, you know, I kind of have all these um, questions I have laid out, and I won't necessarily ask all of them, but I'll try and structure it in such of a way that it kind of has a very easy to follow format but um as far as like getting conversation out of people is concerned uh, it largely comes down to the guest themselves if they're willing mm-hmm. to talk and also yeah like how the host conducts themselves like i think right that one thing i've always kind of prided myself on with this podcast is i've been able to get anyone to kind of at least at least be comfortable you know they don't have to speak a lot because we're all different but Absolutely. yeah, like that comfortability will give you, um, well, will kind of pave the way for you to be able to ask certain questions, sometimes personal questions as well. One of the things about doing a show like Wild Nights is mm. because the the nature of it is to come on and tell a really wild story. Usually people who are willing to tell a really wild story are on the more open side so i haven't had to struggle for conversation knock on wood that's metal but whatever (laughs) i haven't had to struggle for conversation which that's been it makes it much easier which i'm sure you know absolutely uh what kind of topics other than you know the story itself do you tend to discuss on the podcast Well, usually because of the nature of what's going on, I ask how people are surviving the quarantine, how they're surviving the pandemic, what their what their hopes are for afterwards. Uh, That's always kind of random. I do research on the guests uh, ahead of time as well, because I've only known um, out of the. 13 episodes that I've done I've only known well probably four or five of my guests everybody else I've reached out to Mm. on a blind email just knowing a little bit about them or their field I've reached out to them on a blind email so the friends that are a little bit more personal 
I've been able to share, you know, maybe we would go back and forth on a wild night that we shared together after they tell their story. And then the other people, I just kind of find out about their state because New York is a very, New York City especially is a very specific place. So if they don't live in this area, I'm I'm like, what's your state like? What are you guys up to? Uh, What are you, you know, what's your hopes for the future Think in terms of, you know, the party world? So yeah, that's, that's kind of where I veer. Yeah, no, that's that's um, a very intelligent way of going about it. It's it's the same for me. I I tend to look at those things too. I mean, it, it's tricky one with the with the COVID nineteen thing because sometimes I'll, I'll look at where they're from and you know I'll have that question question written down, but I don't always ask it because I wonder like, do people really want to hear? Like it's it's good in a way, but it's, maybe it's yeah. not. It's tricky, isn't it? Because it's like it's happening, yeah. and we can't pretend it's not. And our job as, as content creators is to provide a medium where it's kind of gives you a distraction. So obviously if you're pulled back yeah. into the reality of the situation, it just, you know, defeats the point, doesn't it? But at the same time, you know, you don't want to completely ignore it either. <laughs> right, 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 right. So um, yeah, that, that, that's kind of where I veer. Yeah, no, I, th- I think it's, 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 it sounds like a, a sensible way of going about it for sure. Um, yeah. I know it's still early days, but what have you learned through podcasting so far? I have learned that in terms of editing, doing this on my own and everything, I've learned I really do have to make a schedule the night Mm. before of the things I want to accomplish, people I want to contact, this and that. If I find somebody interesting on television, nowadays it's so easy to contact someone with the internet You can, you know, your chances of getting somebody who has maybe 500,000 followers on Instagram isn't as unlikely as you might think it is. Um, So I've learned, I've learned the levels of fame and recognition and like being verified. The numbers, when you look at someone's Instagram, you're like, oh, they have 20,000 followers. This person has 200,000 followers. This person has a million followers. A million's not as much as you think, and they're not as unattainable as you think. So I've learned that a lot of guests aren't as unattainable as you think. I've learned to kind of be true, not kind of, to totally be true to myself. Everybody's gift in the world is that you're yourself. Mm. You know what I mean? Nobody is anybody else. So there's, and you're not right. And you're never going to be good at being someone else. I mean, unless you're an actor preparing for a role or something like that, but in terms of being your authentic self in a podcast, nobody has the gift of being you. So just give them the best gift. The only thing you can be, which is yourself. So I don't, um, I try if I hear another podcast to be like, oh, that that was so funny. I should do something like that. It's mm. Like, no, just do what you know is true to you. I I don't know if this was the same episode that you listened to, but I one time speaking of Joe Rogan, I was very stoned going to bed. Am I allowed to say that on this podcast? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was <laughs> I was very stoned going to bed. And I was laying in bed and I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw Joe Rogan posted that aliens were going to touch earth in 180 days. And then my mind starts wandering and I start thinking, what if aliens come to earth and they start integrating themselves into our communities and stuff? People, you know, humans are adaptable. We're going to start like dating them and there's going to be kind of like this thing. And then I go, would I have sex with an alien? Is that something I would do? And so I just started without judgment. I just without judgment took my notebook, which I always have a notebook next to my bed. Good idea. I took my notebook and I started writing. I started writing this poem called Would I Bang an Alien? Yeah, and I remember this. It was good. I tweaked it. Yeah. And I I wrote it and it was silly, but it was also like a little raunchy. So it wasn't like totally PG-13. It was silly. It was raunchy. And it was a little vulnerable because that's not a comedy medium that people usually go to. It's like poems. That's not super popular Mm. in terms of like what's popular in pop culture for comedy. But I was proud of it. And I thought it was funny. And uh, I, I said, this is your podcast. You can do whatever you want on it put the poem in the podcast. And the response I got was so positive. 
people really loved it. They thought it was so funny. Um, and you know, there could be people out there who are like, oh, this girl sucks like that, but, but I don't care about them. I got a positive response from it. And I got it from just being myself and saying, this is my form of comedy, my form of comedy. Maybe I don't do, I, I've always been an improviser. I did mm. improv for 10 years. I have never tried stand up only like <laughs> when I'm holding court at a party or something. But, uh, so I, and I never considered myself a writer, the pot doing the podcast. I've started to consider myself a comedy writer and so I'm just trusting myself where where my thoughts go yeah I think you're onto something there for sure thank you I really really enjoyed I'd I'd say I would say to my listeners now make sure you go check out Wild Nights with with Rocky Powell because it's a very good podcast thank you so much no 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 I'm I'm being I'm being honest being sincere I appreciate that I think, I think I even subscribed to the channel as well I enjoyed it so much thank you thank you so much I really appreciate that Let's circle back to, to the um, the the pod, uh, getting people on the podcast with a lot of viewers. Have you actually managed to get anyone with like blue checks or like hundreds of thousands of followers or whatever? I have gotten uh, not a blue check. My my guest this week has is a very popular Canadian drag mm-hmm. artist named Rogue. Um, I they had about they had the most followers of all my guests so far and I've had seven shows and they had about 12,000 followers okay yeah that's pretty sizable um have you ever heard of the tv show big brother yeah well as in the yeah yeah I think it's an elimination I didn't know if they had it over there yeah I think we originated it here in the UK Um, oh that's awesome it's a great show it's based if anyone doesn't know what Big Brother is, it's a reality TV show. They put 16 people in a house and they do challenges. One person is the head of household. So they're in charge of nominating two people to go home. And it's just challenges. It's like a social game, but also a physical game and a mental game. And um, I was, I contacted a lot of people from the later seasons of Big Brother. Oh, and I heard, I heard back from three of them which was incredible. I'm like, Oh my God, I watch these people on TV. And one of them, one of her people contacted me back and she kind of, and she kind of was like, you know, you have a low following. I don't know if we, Screw you know, those that. people, man. Yeah. And the other two said they would be down to do it. And they responded back to me and they have probably over 200,000 followers each and, and a verified check. But when I contacted them back, one of them, he hasn't gotten back to me. And the other one said, yeah, I'm totally down to do this, et cetera, et cetera. And when I sent her the follow-up, I haven't heard back from her, but I'm not like counting my, you know, I might send one more follow-up, but if I don't hear back from them, that's totally fine. Mm. You know, maybe it's not a good fit for them and I'm just going to keep pursuing. Like I said, my luck with guests has been great. So I'm just going to keep, keep going for it. I'm going to have a little bit of a mini rant here, so I hope you don't mind. It's just a five, ten minute thing. Um, okay. So, no, it won't be that long. Basically, the reason <laughs> that I asked about that is that I've had um, similar situations contacting people. And um, the problem that I have with it is that, you know, as you said, it doesn't really matter how many followers someone has. I mean, you can have a million followers, but then you can only maybe only uh, 10,000 of those people actually interact with the content. Same with YouTube, you know, there's YouTubers with like 10 million subs, but they only get like, well, I say only, but they get like te- 2 million views per video. So there's still like, you know, 80% of people not, not watching the video, right? It's just how it works, right? But um, when it comes to like contacting like quote unquote famous people, uh, there, 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 it does seem to be this issue and it, it pisses me off that, you know, you have these PR people and sometimes a lot of the time, the people themselves kind of looking at your following and kind of laughing at it, like, um, or just not taking you seriously. Like I won't yeah. name the guy, but I reached out to, and I've said this on the podcast before, so I apologize to anyone who's, who's already heard me rant, but since we're talking about it, I reached out to this one wrestler, uh, cause I'm a fan of pro wrestling and, mm-hmm. um, he got, he got in contact with me, you know, he replied and everything. So I was pretty stoked. And, you know, this, this guy's on weekly television and everything. Um, and then, yeah, just went cold on me, basically. Um, I don't know why, you know, he said that he, he was willing to work out dates and stuff. And then 
I, I would guess, I'm just theorizing that he looked at the numbers and he was like, yeah, screw who, who's this Absolutely. Guy, right? And the thing mm-hmm. is, it's not about how many numbers you have. And the thing is, I know how this is going to make me sound, but this podcast will have good numbers one day. I'm certain of it. Um, I, it's a feeling, I know, you know, maybe it's slightly egotistical to say that, you know, but when you have a good feeling about something and it's going well, nothing can stop you. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm looking right. at the quality mm-hmm. of the podcast improving versus when I did the first five. I mean, this is episode 60. So we've, nice. we've gotten, we've gotten quite far. I'm getting all sorts of different guests on the show. Like we're going somewhere with this. It's only a matter of time. And Absolutely. I feel that that's the thing. Like you can have loads and loads of followers, but you can still be a really shitty interviewer. Like I've discovered like being a good interviewer takes various different skills. And I think that's far more important than like how many followers you have. And the thing is, mm-hmm. it's a two way thing. So like, yeah, okay. They might be looking at your profile going, how's this going to benefit me? Well, I'll tell you how it will benefit you. It will benefit you from the perspective of this person might ask me questions that no one else thinks to ask me. If mm-hmm. I'm on a chat show, let's say, I don't know, like Jimmy Kim or G- Jimmy Fallon, I fucking hate that guy. I'll tell you why. <laughs> and then I'll tell you why I love him. <laughs> well, and it's a personal reason and maybe it'll sway you, but go ahead. Okay, well, I don't know how you can stand that fake laugh crap. Um, I've told people on my guest um, on, on my show to go check out the uh, episode where he's interviewing Ryan Gosling and clearly pissing him off with his questioning and fake laughing. I'll watch and, that. And but um, anyway, this isn't about him. But the point is, when, you, when people go on those shows, celebrities go on those shows, the whole thing is kind of staged in a way that it's not a proper interview. It's kind of just, hey, here's your latest project. I'll ask you some funny stuff. We'll, we'll make a little entertaining bit for like 10 minutes and then it's done. Right. But I always walk out of that kind of thinking, oh, this is disappointing. There's so many things you could ask this person about. And like, how did they feel when they did this particular role in this particular moment? Or what about this incident? There's so many things you could ask them. And that's what I look at when I'm looking at my podcast is like, if I had, if I got a big person on my show, yeah, I'm not going to ask them. I'm going to approach it differently. I'm not going to ask them the stuff that everyone else has asked them. I'm going to ask them things that I haven't heard them talk about, or at least, you know, try to ask them different questions and, and something make, make it a bit more interesting right and that is the value that i think is offered in you know appearing on someone's show who yeah maybe doesn't have the following yet that's because the thing is yeah those people get interviewed all the time like hundreds of times in in a month probably and uh yeah they get bored of it and stuff but do you know why they get bored of it it's because all those people work in the entertainment industry and they're told you can only ask them this you have to ask them this Whereas on podcasts, you don't have that issue. You know, this is uncensored. I can ask right. someone whatever the hell I want. <laughs> so that's my little thing, mini yeah. rant on that. <laughs> well, I, I loved that rant. I have a couple things to say. The reason I can't hate Jimmy Fallon. Do you know who the chef Guy Fieri is? Yes. I worked at his restaurant in Times Square for five years. I opened that restaurant and I closed it when I was in my early 20s, early to mid 20s. Um, and Jimmy Fallon, Guy Fieri had gone on Jimmy Fallon's show and to promote the restaurant opening. And he named a drink after Jimmy Fallon. It was called the Jimmy Fallon Boozy Creamsicle. And it was on our menu. And it was this big, like sugary, slushy drink. We hated making them, but, or like getting them from the bar because they came in these gigantic cups and everything. It was a nightmare, but it was named after Jimmy Fallon. So Jimmy Fallon came in the restaurant and I had to wait on him. And so I go up to his table and I go, oh, I think we might have a drink named after you. Just trying to be cutesy, whatever. And he got his meal comped because when celebrities came into that restaurant, they didn't have to pay for anything. So they just would leave a tip. And Jimmy Fallon left me a hundred dollars on no tip and just having one drink and like an order of chicken nuggets. So I can't hate on Jimmy Fallon because he personally paid me a hundred dollars to basically do nothing. But I know a lot of people are bothered by his fake laugh. And that's like a common thing. I think even my brother the other night was like, I can't watch this. He's fake laughing. And, or, or maybe it was a friend of mine. We were watching his interview with RuPaul, but. The reason that doesn't sway me for a couple of reasons. (laughs) No, 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 this is true. When I went to the States back in 2014, Uh, I discovered what the tip culture was like. I had no idea. In the UK, 
we don't have the same tip system. Uh, you get flat. Oh, I'm very aware. Right. <laughs> I'm very and, aware you guys have a different tip system. Right. Waitresses <laughs> here, you know, people working in, I've worked in the hospitality industry. You get paid yeah. your wage and then anything on top of that is great, but it's not, it doesn't count towards your wages. Whereas in America, you get paid like That's basically everything. nothing and you're living off the tips. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and so he had to tip anyway. Secondly, if he doesn't tip a high amount, right? Imagine how that looks for his PR. The guy is is rich. Yeah. He's successful, yeah. right? He has to. If I was rich and successful, I would have to every time I would go out. It's just what you have to do yeah. if you're a celebrity and you, you know, you're earning a lot of money. You have to do that. So that doesn't, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, actually, what I do think is more important is what was he like when you were serving him? Was he dismissive? Was Pleasant. he nice? No pleasant kind and just very personable sweet he had a good energy and also my ex-boyfriend the one that actually called and interrupted this podcast um I don't have as many ties to him I, I know he's come up a lot but it's just because he interrupted us but he uh used to work at a restaurant close to where Jimmy Fallon worked in Rockefeller Center and Jimmy Fallon would come in like once a week and he would always tell me that Jimmy Fallon was like gracious a good tipper because his meals weren't free there. Gracious, good tipper, kind, personable. But I mean, I've had friends that have hated Jimmy Fallon since I was in high school because he would break on SNL sketches and stuff. So I know, especially men, for some reason, I know he's not everyone's cup of tea. I don't have a problem with him. I think he's fun and funny and cutesy. But I know that your opinion is not an unpopular one. Credit where credit's due. If he's a nice right. guy in real life, then all right, fair enough. Because I don't know the guy personally. Obviously, I'm yeah, yeah. just sharing that. <laughs> the thing is, right, I, I liked the show originally. And then I started seeing him doing that fake laughing crap. And the thing is, he doesn't have mm -hmm. to do that. That's a conscious choice. Yeah. Right. And the, the thing yeah. is, it's a great show. He's got a good band there. He's a talented like person as far as comedy and music is concerned. So it puzzles Absolutely. me that he does that. Like it's frustrating. Do you know what I mean? Because if, if that was just him and, and he was just like an ass and you know, that, that would be one thing. But as you have sort of illustrated right. behind the scenes, he's not like that. So it's like, why is he doing that? That's the frustration, but at least, okay, we've learned that he's a nice guy in real life. So fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah. Let, let's talk about, um, I've got a couple more questions for you on, on podcasting. What do yeah. you like most about podcasting? I like after doing the interviews with people, I like the post conversation. There's been like, I've gotten a lot of gems of conversation out of, uh, just not stuff that even wasn't on film oh, okay. and recorded just, I'm really liking the connections to people, like even someone like you, like now we have this connection. I'm never going to forget you. We're going to both probably continue our podcasting journey together. You know what I mean? And watch each other grow. Mm. And now like when I go over to England, I have a friend over there that I can like grab a drink with. You know what I mean? When you come here, you have a friend you can like grab a drink with and we can kind of like, now we're like coming up in this thing together. I've met a couple of radio DJs from across the United States who now oh, cool. I'm liking, I'm liking their pictures on Instagram. They're liking my stuff on Instagram and I, I'm liking, I'm loving doing the podcast because I love the finished product of it, but mm -hmm. I'm more so I've always been a very social person. So, and the pandemic has put a halt on my social life. So meeting new people has always been great for me. So meeting people in my field who are cool and fun and spread out all over the country, that has been the most rewarding part. And I'm so excited to continue making those connections with people. That's awesome. That's really wholesome yeah. stuff. <laughs> uh, what are the challenges associated with podcasting for you? The first challenge is getting the episode together. I don't mind editing. Um, it's just long you know it's a really long process and it takes hours I don't think people realize that you know a 30 minute interview especially I like to cut out the likes and ums and uhs and a 30 minute interview could take about eight or nine hours to edit 
Damn, really? Well, yeah, well, for me, like, I do, I'm so meticulous about it because I okay. hate dead air. I hate dead air. So uh, for me, the editing um, and just making sure everything's perfect, that's really challenging. And then just the the growth of it. You know, mm-hmm. it's growing very, very uh, slowly. So I think the challenge of not getting discouraged and yeah. saying, just keep your, keep your foot on the gas. I actually, this is so corny, but I actually, I have a notebook and the notebook, I write, you know, my to-do list for the next day with the podcast. Oh, I have to put this up. I have to, you know, contact this person. I have to edit this thing for this many hours. But in the back of the notebook, I've started writing backwards and I'll write like my small accomplishments for the day. Like, oh, I hit this goal. Oh, I talked to this person. Oh, I got this done. Oh, this person reached out to me. So if I'm ever feeling discouraged, I can go back and read my accomplishments so far and feel like, keep going. You know what I mean? That's a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, no, it's important to focus on small goals and then little things yeah. to build to the bigger things. I mean, so certainly in these times, I think it's very of important. Course. Um, one thing I wanted to circle back to real quick. I know I keep saying that, but there's just so many things to ask, man. I'm we're, we're in it. We're in it. We're having a great time. <laughs> um, obviously, you mentioned that you know you, you're contacting these people with, with a lot of followers sometimes with blue ticks and stuff. And right. uh, I find this interesting because I contacted someone who I think he has a blue check. I don't know another wrestler. And uh, the reason that I did is he actually dropped his business email in a, on a tweet, and I was like. Psh- why not? You know, I, I always contact people. They, they usually never, ever get back to me, but you never know. And he got back to me and I don't know if it was his management or him personally, but he actually uh, said, yeah, here's my fee. And I'm like, for, for a podcast, is that usual? Is that? And I talked to my friends about it and they were like, that's weird. Have you ever had anything like that? No, I haven't had okay. anyone tell me their price. And if somebody was like, hey, you know, you're going to have to pay me $500 or whatever amount of money they wanted to be on the podcast, I would just say, well, then, you know, you're not going to be on the podcast because yes, I, I certainly can't pay you. I don't know if like, you know, bigger podcasts, like we were talking about Joe Rogan and stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he, he pays those guests or if they get a stipend of some sort. But yeah, I, I haven't experienced that. I did experience something a little strange. Um, so I saw this musician and I won't use names. I, I'll tell you off camera if you like but I won't use names on the podcast but I saw a guy viewed my story early on this was about you know five six weeks ago this yeah this happens a lot man I will yeah we'll start with the verified check looking at your story yes so I just had this one guy now I have a a lot of verified yeah no nobody following but a lot and so I thought that's interesting how that comes up in the algorithm but we digress so this guy who's a musician looked at my story. So I did a little, little research on him and I go, Oh, okay. He's got about 17,000 followers. Oh, okay. He's really good at playing in this band. Okay. I've never heard of him, but that doesn't mean he's not anybody. So I found his email and I said, if he's interested in my, if he's watching my story multiple times, he's obviously like, maybe he's listened to an episode. Maybe he knows somebody who knows what the connection is. So I follow him. And I email him and I ask him to be on the show. He responds. So I'm over the moon. Oh my God, this is the early days. I'm getting somebody so big and he's going to be my first big guest. This is so exciting. I'm on the right trajectory. Exactly. So then I notice that now, now I start to notice a couple weird things and I honestly have a reputation for getting scammed a lot, like to the point where now like my <laughs> friends and family are not surprised when I get scammed because oh, I fall no. for scams all the time, which is a horrible thing to say to the world, but it's true. Um, and I'm trying to get better at it. And this is an example of me getting better at it. So he says, yes, we'll figure out a date, mm-hmm. et cetera. So when I respond back to him, like, oh, let's figure out a date. I don't hear anything. So I start like, you know, doing a little research on his profile and then I notice for the amount of followers he has, he sure doesn't have a lot of likes on his picture. He's getting 60 likes on his picture. And I'm like, in my personal Instagram, I have 1,200 followers and I get more than 60 likes on a picture. Why do you, why do you have 17,000 followers and you're not getting a lot of likes? That smells like somebody bought their followers to me. Yeah. Then, then he tagged, he said he had his own music uh, label 
he tagged a very well-known artist who I was like, oh, he's associated with this person. And I clicked on that person's profile. I was like, oh, I didn't even know this person had an Instagram. I will follow them. And I clicked on their profile. That profile didn't exist. I'm like, okay, well, why would they tag that person if they don't exist? Then I went to his Spotify and he was asking for donations, but not saying what he was asking for donations for. So then I type in his name and I write the word scam in Google. Turns out he's like a scam artist. He came oh. up, he, li- he made his own like magazine where he like a lot, it was like so obvious he lied about the questions and the answers. It was so obvious he wrote the questions to ask himself, like they were just so pointed. And, and so he's been contacting me and now he put his label manager or something on the emails with me. And he's like, Hey, we'd love to get him on the podcast. And I've kind of just been like, Oh, you know, uh, we're very booked on guests right now, but I'll definitely contact you contacted me again. Hey, we'd love to get a solid date for him on the podcast. I said, I would reach out in 2021. Thank you so much. Like blah, blah, blah. And then they contact me a third time. And I kind of was like a bit curter, but yeah, I, I was like, oh God, this guy's just a scam artist. Like, I don't want him to be on my podcast. And then eventually in like five years, if he tries to scam the wrong person or something comes out about him yeah, that yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to even be associated with this person. So yeah, I mean, there you do have to be careful just because someone has 17,000 followers and a verified check. I mean, I know a girl who banged somebody who, who, who had the power to give her the verified check. And she's just like a, you know, a small time comedian. Yeah, she's a small-time comedian, and she has the verified next to her because she slept with the person who had the power to do that. So <laughs> it means it means nothing. Don't let like we we ask people who don't have a verified check next to our name should not let it intimidate us at this stage in the game. That's madness, man. I mean, I got to say, yeah, that there, there are a lot of scams out there, especially now during this uh, uh-huh. COVID nineteen epidemic. It's kind of sickening to me. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I will say with this in particular. Um, for instance, I'm a musician and I post huh? covers on, on my uh, Instagram page. And every time I do that, I get inundated with these messages from these um, basic. OK, so it's a really weird scam. Basically, a profile will contact you and we'll be like, hey, yeah, you know, we really love your song, blah, 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 blah. If you pay us X and X amount, we'll feature your video on our profile. Now, here's the interesting thing about the scam they actually do what they say they're going to do. Right. They they download your video, they put it on there and you know, it supposedly gets X amount of views and all these likes and stuff. Now, when you do further investigation, you realize all of those followers are bought or fake or whatever. It's all fake comments. It's disheartening. You know, for me, that's what this guy does. I think it happened one time to me but it was only like four dollars something small and i thought i'll try just to see if it's a scam and i was like okay i haven't yeah it hasn't burned a hole in my pocket but they are scamming loads of musicians this way and yeah there's so many sort of scams like this but the one you just laid out there is really elaborate like that's kind of a bit yeah. crazy uh but i think that's what he does yeah 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 exactly exactly um another thing i wanted to say as well just on, on this topic is that I think those profiles, the blue tick check marks uh, that, that sort of view your stories on, on Instagram, I think there's a number of reasons why that happens. One of them, I think, is that, you know, if, if you're getting a lot of views on, on, on traction on your stuff anyway, then they sort of find you for the explore page um, or through hashtags or whatever. So that's an element of it. Also, I don't actually think, I'd say like nine times out of 10, I don't think it's the real person or the musicians. It's like their PR team trying to build a following or whatever. Um, and I think, I mean, here's the thing. It's, it's a bit weird because a lot of the time you'd expect them to just follow you in the hope that you follow back and, you know, it's that age old yeah. kind of unfollow, follow thing. But um, yeah, instead they just view your story. And I think it's more investigative. I think they're just kind of yeah. trying to see like, oh, is this person worth, you know, doing something with, or maybe, I don't know, I'm just theorizing, but I don't actually think it's the person. I think it's a team behind them. Yeah, or something I think like you're that. right. Yeah, I think you're right. But anyways, um, yeah, so... You're multi-talented. You've got a lot of different things that you're doing. Um, You mentioned you did 10 years of improv. Talk to us a little bit about that. So when I graduated college, I went to school for theater, my bachelor's in theater and acting. 
sorry. I think my low battery just came up. <laughs> That's someone who doesn't charge her cell phone all night. So I have my degree in theater. And when I graduated, everyone said, you have to take improv classes because you want to be good. Commercial auditions are going to strictly ask you to improvise. So you need to know how to act. Yes, but you also need to know how to improvise. So about six months after I graduated, I started taking improv classes and took improv classes for about a year and a half, then started perform and about six months in started performing improv uh, with friends I still have to this day. And then I started taking more improv classes. I don't know if you've ever heard of UCB, but I was taking classes there. It's the Upright Citizens Brigade. Okay. Amy Poehler is the founder of it. And it's like the biggest improv theater in, uh, in New York and LA but uh, not the biggest in the country. The upper, uh, second city, I would say, is like the most famous one. But we digress from that. But yeah, I, I took improv classes. And then I was doing performing with independent teams, which independent improv teams are teams that you form with your friends and you book your own shows and everything. So you're not affiliated with a theater. Even though you may have met through a theater, you're not affiliated with the theater and you book all your own shows. Now, when you become affiliated with the theater, if you audition to be on a house team, that's what they call them. If you audition to be on a house team for a theater, then you have a built-in show every week. They choose who you're on a team with. They choose when you perform and who you perform with steadily for about six months. And then they switch it up or they keep it the same for another six months, et cetera, et cetera. So I did improv for about three years and then I was placed on a house team in January of 2014. And I stayed on a house team till um, at this theater called the People's Improv Theater. I was on a house team there for a little over six years. And then I was on a team at the uh, theater called the Armory for about a year and a half before the pandemic, or maybe it was only like eight months and then the pandemic hit. But yeah, I, I was doing improv, you know, since I was 22, I was doing improv at least once a week, sometimes four times a week. Were you doing short form or long form? Long form. Okay. Okay. And do you prefer yeah. long form? Yeah, I, I've not really, although I think, you know, short form is really fun. I never really got into it. There was the long form scene in New York is much bigger mm -hmm. than the short form scene. And so I think I just always kind of gravitated towards that. And then because I never really l tried to seek out doing short form, I, I didn't do it. Uh, but I have some friends that do short form and I would have no problem doing short form. And I actually think short form is a little bit more lucrative because it's more digestible for the masses. But yeah, I, I always stuck with long form. You tend to go more for the uh, contest side of improv comedy, or do you go for, um, you know, like particular jobs where it will allow you to do so? What, what do you mean? So um, I actually had another guest on here who was an uh, improv comedian. And uh, mm -hmm. he basically, as I understand, he's sort of more in training. So he's uh, been doing it for a couple of years now. Uh -huh. and he basically said that, like, you know, his focus at the moment is more contests and stuff, but he has like this improv group. And uh, we, we sort of got into the, the the conversation of like, well, can you earn a living from this? Like what, what's mm -hmm. the deal there? And I understood that from the contests perspective, obviously you can win, um, you know, there's championships, you can win money from that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But there is also opportunities to earn a living from this in different fields. So I just wondered like, have you had the opportunity to do so? And if so, where? Uh, not contests. I've not heard of that here. Okay. Contest improv. Uh, I know that they, well, we have a lot of improv festivals, which okay. you have to pay to do. And they're all over the country. I've actually performed in England. There no was an improv festival. I think I did it in 2014 or 15, but I, I yeah, I got to perform in England, uh, in London. That was really cool. But the contest I've not heard of, I would say how somebody makes a living from improv here is usually they, you know, they get really engulfed in the community and they'll either get a job writing or they'll start to write their own characters through improv and then start auditioning for comedy or coming up with their own kind of comedy scene. But to make it a living from improv shows here is pretty difficult. It's more so what the improv shows, the, they make stepping stones to get you somewhere else in comedy rather than making a living from improv. 
and have you hone other skills sorry to interrupt go on no 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 I was just gonna say improv hones other skills and it opens other doors but yeah like those house team shows I was doing I I wasn't making a living from it but you know you would get commercial opportunities through the theater they'll send you emails oh you can audition for this you can audition for this so that that would be how the money was made okay thanks for enlightening us on that Mm -hmm. um yeah, like, are you are you thinking of sort of continuing to do this, uh, obviously, post COVID um, in the future? I mean, you, you you mentioned that you did it for sort of 10 years or something. So yeah. is are you looking to move past it? Or is it something that's still going to be in your sphere in terms of work? Well, before COVID, I was performing at two theaters, one on Wednesdays and one on Fridays. The theater that I was performing on Fridays, that I would describe as more guerrilla improv. It was just people who, have you ever heard of guerrilla theater? I haven't. What's that? So guerrilla theater is when something's like very raw and authentic. It's usually like black box theater and they're not trying to do it for, like there's no bells and whistles. It's it's raw theater. Okay. Um, yeah, and not even spelled like gorilla. It's spelled G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. But so the theater I was performing on Friday is more of a, a gorilla theater, a more raw theater, a more ev- everybody who's doing this is doing this because they absolutely love improv. It's almost like underground. I don't want to say cultish because I it's not a cult, but it's it's more dedicated, no bells and whistles. I have, I do perform with though that theater over Zoom every other Friday night or so just to stay involved with the community. And if it opens up after COVID, I would continue to perform with them. Uh, but hopefully that would, that would probably be the only improv theater I would continue with. I don't think I was planning on leaving the, my Wednesday night um theater just because it was like you know when you can feel that it's time it was time Mm -hmm. for me to kind of leave there so yeah I would continue with the Friday night guerrilla theater improv and then probably put my focus elsewhere fair enough and uh you you mentioned that you hadn't done stand-up comedy yet is that right you haven't Mm -hmm. done that yet okay but um what what else have you done in 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 the sphere of comedy so far um I've I booked, uh, well, I wrote a pilot. My friend and I wrote a pilot and we worked on it for a year and it was really well received. And we were going to start like get, you know, taking the next steps to make it something. And then COVID hit and it just didn't seem like the realistic thing. And our third partner that we were working with, you know, his, his heart wasn't as in it. So that kind of fell on its face. I would say, um, I booked once I booked a uh, prank show. Have you ever heard of the TV show Punked? Yeah. I booked like a YouTube esque prank show that never went anywhere, but I was uh. kind of like the, the Dak Shepherd on that show, and that was through improv. Okay. So I think for me, I'm going to try to use this time to work on impressions um, and maybe All try right. to write up some write up some characters. I think that'll be what I'm going to use this time for. And then we'll see what the lay of the land is because now that COVID has shown us we can audition over zoom and we can do shows over zoom and mm. not everything needs to be done in person. I think it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah. It's a blessing in the sense that you can get talent from anywhere. You don't have to just be limited to New York or LA. Um, so it's a blessing for people across the country, but it's a curse for the people who have like uprooted their whole lives, moved to a place like New York or LA. And they're like, I'm, I'm in this, I'm in the thick of this, but now somebody random who's never had to like, you know, live a day in the life of a New Yorker has the same opportunity for way less rent. <laughs> How do you navigate like not having an audience because i mean many of the comedians i've spoken to have, have obviously highlighted how much of a big deal that is and i've got to say it's, it's not just comedy you know it's the same with professional wrestling with sports you know it's mm-hmm. it's really affected everything like how do you navigate that and still make an entertaining show so for the improv shows i do i don't even think about the audience i'm doing those shows strictly to stay connected to the community Mm -hmm. do a little fun it's never going to be the same as live theater improv so I just do it to stay connected with my friends at that theater and so to keep showing my face and keep saying like I love improv and I'm in this with us and like I'll do this 20 minute Friday night show if it means like we're we're still you know seeing you're seeing my face I'm seeing your face 
and to navigate not having an audience. That's why I, I started a podcast. I was like, I need to get an audience in some way, shape or form to get this off. So that's how, but yeah, there's nothing like a live audience. Even last night, I don't know when you're going to air this episode, but last night was the uh, inauguration concert right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and watching these musicians who would normally be performing for a room full of people and having that energy. It was beautiful. They did like kind of music video esque performances, but it was definitely different. So we're all kind of adjusting to this new post COVID during COVID pre COVID. I don't know. We're I don't know. Though. It's, it's different with music though. Cause you can perform to an audience of none and that's fine with of comedy. You're yeah, riffing yeah, off yeah. People, you know, it's like the yeah. energy is what you feed off. Then, you know, okay, this is good. This sucks. Move on. Yeah. Yeah. But how, yeah how this do you, works. Well, how, how do you navigate that though? Like, I mean, how do you know if you, if your comedy is hitting home or not? You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. Like, like for example i'll give you i'll give you an example like um yeah. there's this show i watch in, in england called have i got news for you it's like a satirical um politics current affairs style show uh-huh. right? and there's uh there's a comedian on the show as a panelist and then there's a guy who uh writes like a an independent newspaper publication but basically you know it's it's a contest to see who can make the best jokes on the news and stuff right yeah and uh, obviously they're not able to film it right now because of COVID, uh, but they've mm-hmm. done like online Zoom version and I appreciate their efforts. I love the show, but like- They're trying, yeah. They're trying. And like, to be fair, they can kind of, you know, there is there is the reaction of the other people in the Zoom call, you know, so there's that, but it, it feels so off. And I can tell that they feel that as well. You can feel the energy off then that like, this is not the same. Yeah. So like, how do you navigate that? I know you you, you sort of mentioned what you did with, with the long form, but like just standard comedy, like how do you know if you're going in the right direction? Well, I guess I guess I don't, you know, I because no. I don't. Improv was the only comedy that I was doing live, so right. obviously, you know, we don't have that audience anymore. So I just have to do it in hopes that one day we will. But there, yeah, there's no comparison to to live audience. I think that's why there's a lot of people out there who don't have other fulfillments and who don't have other hobbies at this moment. They're kind of going crazy and struggling. Do you have any plans in the future to maybe do a uh, stand-up comedy? My brother is like really, my brother is a comedian too. And he's okay. like really, uh, he's like really pushing for me to do stand-up. Do it, the, do oh- it. <laughs> I think my hesitation and trepidation for doing stand-up is I worked at a stand-up comedy club as a cocktail waitress for my early, in my early twenties. I have tons of friends who've done stand-up and I know what a grind it is. Mm. It is, it's a different grind than improv. Improv is a more structured grind, a more social grind, and it's a more team grind. But with, with stand-up, to really be great at stand up, you have to hit open mic after open mic after open mic. You're working a nine to five job and then you're going to open mics from 530 till two in the morning. Sometimes you're not even getting up there. And for me, where I'm at in life, even though I think I would really enjoy doing stand up, I, I think I don't. I don't know if I want to commit to that. I don't know if I have that grind in me. Okay. You know, that that's my, that's my only thing. Like I, I know to really be good at stand up, you've got to give it like five, six nights a week, six, seven hours a night. And then you have to balance your regular life on top of it. And I just don't know if that's um a goal of mine right now. I know that's what it takes. So you sort of mentioned before, like obviously you'd worked on, on like show concepts and stuff like that. And, and that you're more of a comedy writer as opposed right. to maybe a performer. Do you think you're well, going to Well, definitely do... more of a performer than a writer. I've, I've just oh, okay. started co- like embracing the comedy writing. That's something that I've just started embracing, but I've definitely more, was more of a performer for the longest time. Do you think you're going to do that more in future though? Like, you know, maybe pitch shows to like, I don't know, Netflix, HBO, like comedy style shows yeah. or something like that. I think I'm definitely going to embrace writing more and see where it goes. I think I was always judgmental. I was always scared of what people thought. And then 
you just can't be scared of that because think about how many bad and bad doesn't mean it was bad, but think about how many things you've seen in your life where you're just like, that wasn't funny at all, but they're in such a higher position because they took the risk. What if you actually have comedy that's good to share with the world? Like you have to take the risk. Nothing good comes if you're not taking the risk and putting yourself out there. Somebody could hate it. Somebody could love it. There's so many different interpretations of what is good, what good comedy is. So I think I'm just using this time to not judge myself and say like, you, you are good. So it, just lean more into the writing aspect. So that's what I'm going to do. Just lean more into the writing aspect. I wish you the best of luck with that. I think you'll have a lot of Thank success you. in that field. Thank you. What do you do for a living like right now? Like, obviously I was going to ask this in general, but yeah. I think it's probably more, accurate to kind of ask right now in the, what people are dubbing the new normal like how, how are you kind of making it day to day um well at first I mean I have a few friends you know everybody's kind of in the same boat except if, if someone was an essential worker and so right. you know when this first happened none of us were working everybody's pods were very small the, pe- the amount of people that we would see and then over the summer it's like you know, everybody's kind of getting paid just, even though it's not a lot of money, we were getting paid basically just to stay home. And so I would go to the park with friends and we would keep it like really socially distant or it'd be the same group of people. And we would keep it really socially distant and and be outside and kind of go on bike rides, go on walks, drink outside, you know, things like that. And then the winter hit and more people were starting to go back to work. Um, and live their lives and stuff like that. And, and nobody's like at, at home as much. I, before the pandemic was working as a waitress and mm-hmm. an actress, obviously auditioning, I had a ton of voiceover auditions and things like that every day. And then this all just stopped. Fortunately, right now I'm in a position where I don't have to go back to waitressing and I'm trying to just ride that out as much as possible. So I'm just honestly Christian spending my days working on the podcast and that's where I'm putting all my energy until I get to a place where they're like okay you have to go back to work and then hopefully by the time I do have to go back to work I'll either be making enough money on the podcast where I I don't have to go back to you know waiting tables in a post-pandemic world Mm. or bartending in a post-pandemic world that's my goal absolutely absolutely Mm -hmm. and um I don't doubt that you'll be able to achieve that. I think um, it, it, I'm, I'm weirdly in, a, in the same boat. I've been unemployed since uh, February of last year. And um, because I was coming back from another country, came back uh-huh. to, to the UK. Where and, were you coming uh, back from? Uh, Estonia in, uh, in Europe. It's close to oh, nice. Lithuania and, and Russia. Oh, and cool. um, so I came back and I figured, oh, yeah, a couple of months. No problem. I'll get a job. <laughs> and um but the, the weird thing is, is it's funny how you get blessings in disguise um yeah. so, sometimes because it's given me what i've always wanted which is time to do youtube and a podcast as well and uh now that's pretty much all i do and uh I'm, obviously i've been like freelancing and and um just making ends meet uh with marketing and stuff over the course of the year but um yeah pretty much i'd say like 90 percent of my time is is doing this and um yeah. I think, yeah, it, it, for many of us, it's been very positive in, in that respect. And, and that's what you always really need, isn't it? Is, is the time to do this. You know, a lot of people complain like, oh, I just don't have the time. This gets in the way, that gets in the way. But if you've got the time, no excuses. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I 100% agree. Um, yeah, you mentioned it quite a few times um, that you're a voice actress, voice actor. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that, like some of the projects you've worked on and uh, yeah, just your career as a voice actor. So it happened kind of organically. I I didn't, uh, I always just considered myself a theater and a TV and film actress, or that's what I was aspiring to be. And in 2016, I went on a vacation with 14 other people. It was a core group of friends and then some like auxiliary pockets of friends. And we all went to Dominican Republic nice so you know I was close with quite a few people on the trip but some of the auxiliary like outer skirts groups of the you know you you spend a week with them and you guys are all together you do get closer Mm. and one of the people on the trip 
was my now voiceover agent. Actually, the wedding I told you earlier that I went to, the outdoor COVID safe wedding I went to, was his wedding uh, yesterday. So shout out to him. Shout out to Tim. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so we we all go on this trip and everybody's bonding and we're having a great time. Um, and he is a voiceover agent. So when we came back from the trip, you know, I had expressed some woes about feeling like I was extreme, like feeling like I was talented and that I'm trying, but I'm just kind of in a group of, you know, brunette women who are of a certain age, like, uh, you know, in their mid twenties who are auditioning in New York and it's just not in our favor. And I, I felt like, you know, just another number. And I had expressed that to him and I, he went over like some of my comedy stuff and then, you know, brought me on into his agency. We also went to the same college just about, uh, and we're in the same theater department, just about seven, six or seven years apart. So we never mm -hmm. knew each other then. And so, yeah, so when we came back from this trip and after bonding on this trip and him doing like a little research into what I could do, I started working with his agency. And from there, they're primarily, they do commercials, but they're primarily lean really heavy into the voiceover department. So I got on that roster. And from there, I mean, the amount of voiceovers I would do a week, I would be auditioning five to eight voiceover recordings a week just auditions. And the, the blessing of it was you could do it from the comfort of your home. So that's where I got really good at editing because I had to edit all these voiceovers on my own. And so, yeah, I, I was doing that. The biggest gig I've ever gotten was a CVS. CVS is a, I don't know if you guys have it there, but CVS is a big like pharmacy. It's kind of like, um, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens. Yeah, 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 it's just like a multi-purpose store, you know what I mean? So, but their CVS is huge in the States and I booked a CVS commercial. And the thing with voiceovers is your agent will email you, this is due at 10 a.m. the next day, but you don't have to send it in. I mean, if you want to eventually work, you have to send in your audition. But one day I was coming home from work I had worked a lunch shift and I was going over a friend's house to watch a TV show. We did it every Thursday. It was like a group of us. And, um, and I didn't feel like recording the CVS audition. It was six different auditions. I was like, ah, oh, I just feel like going to the gym and going straight to his house and watching the show. I don't feel like doing this audition. But then I remembered like, I just spent the morning and the afternoon waitressing I, you know, my living situation at the time, I was living with two random roommates. I was just kind of like sad. And I was like, why would I not do these auditions? This is my yeah. one job is to even if I don't book the job, my one job is to audition. So I went home, I recorded the CVS auditions, I sent them in. And it was like, great, I booked it. And then I worked with them multiple times because that they would, you know, call me in per season to do the same commercial just to change it for like the spring or fall season. So it was a real lesson in like, you have to work for what you want and don't be lazy. And also like, I'll add to that. Yeah. Just go for it. Don't, don't um, mm -hmm. sort of undersell yourself. Like just always go for it. Cause you never know what can happen. Yeah. Who's going to like you. Yeah. Yeah. Con congrats on that. Um, yeah. I'm Thank trying you. to actually get into voice acting myself and it's uh it's tricky. I mean, I haven't made too many moves. I've I've done a little bit of dialogue for a video game, but um, it's like cool. it's not paid. It's like unpaid. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very much trying to build uh, some sort of a portfolio in that. And um, there's a, there's a lot of money to be made in that industry. I actually came across it. Oh, yeah. From a, a childhood friend whose father was like basically like massive in that industry and was rich because of it um but you know basically an unknown uh, which i think is great like imagine just getting really, really successful getting to do loads of cool projects and no one knows who you are fantastic it's just the yeah. perfect, it's the dream <laughs> i would love to be on a cartoon i would love to be on oh, like a yeah. long-running cartoon that would be amazing oh hell yeah yeah like I, I was watching a video of um the actress who does um bart simpson and like how she just has fun with that voice and just fancy cartwright yeah yeah i yeah. just that looks so fun and like she she's so good at it as well like you can tell she's put so many well obviously they've been doing the show for like 30 odd years but absolutely um, 
just the, it's just how she's able to go in and out of that voice is incredible to me yeah because I, I normally have to warm up a little bit before i do like you know like an american accent or something um yeah it's, it's not easy to just jump into so i really admire that skill that is a skill, the jumping in and out. I've been working on a couple of impressions myself and I'll do it really well for one person. And then I'll be like, oh my God, you have to hear this impression. I, I, I like, without a doubt, crush this impression. And then you're like, oh, I can't find the voice placement. Oh my yeah. God. So it's, it is a skill to kind of find in your mouth and your throat where the noise comes out of. Cause sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't, it's a real skill. I, th- I don't know if there's a word for this, but I think it's kind of like muscle memory. Like, because mm-hmm. there's certain voices that I do sometimes now for fun in, in acting videos that I do where I am able to jump straight into it. Like I do this like creepy Southern American dude uh, sometimes as a character. Yeah. And that's really easy to jump into. Um, but then there's other ones where like, if I try and do like a conventional American accent, it's tricky. And sometimes I find myself yeah. maybe not quite getting it right. And you know, so I, th- I think it's like, but my point being that if you can remember that and always have it in mind and know how to jump into it, then that's kind of the key. And I think maybe that comes practice. from practice. Yeah. 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 It's exactly. Practice. exactly. For sure. It's practice. So you're from New York. What are the best and worst things about New York City? Well, uh, the best thing about it pre-COVID, I would say, is there is always something to do. You know, the people are great here. There's, I know a lot of New Yorkers get a bad rap, but the people are really great here. And there's always something to do. There's always a new bar to discover. There's always, you know, a new show to go see and one of the greatest things about it too is it's a a big city but it's also a really small city so you know if you frequent a lot of bars and stuff bartenders get to know you and and running into somebody becomes more special because you're all in this kind of bubble together but I would say that for me was the best thing the worst thing about it um the prices can be a little yeah um tough but it is it's all relative yeah like if you have usually most people and this is a big generalization but usually like most people who live here you know make a job that have a job that can sustain whatever lifestyle they choose um and the opportunities that are here are really really great the negative i would say is the price and unfortunately i hate even saying this unfortunately because of covid the energy has gotten a lot thicker. I've had some weird, like anybody would anywhere, I've had some weird things happen, you know, where you're a little scared or maybe like someone approaches you that could be a little dangerous. You know, people have had worse situations than me, but I don't feel as safe as I used to. Is that because... Because obviously, you know, New York is known as the city that never sleeps. And obviously with COVID being a factor there's going to just be less people around in general so is it kind of like that obviously being a woman uh alone in a major city different element yeah like some obviously you've got to like ideally not travel at night or always be around friends but obviously that's difficult given the circumstances is that kind of what more what you're referring to yeah like the subways i've had to take the subway a few times to go in i live in queens uh, yep. which is one of the five boroughs and manhattan is when people refer to mm-hmm. the city they're talking about manhattan and i'm about maybe an 18 minute ride on the subway into manhattan the subway's right outside my house but um i've had to take the subway a couple times into manhattan and everybody's in a mask but then you know you see that one person who's not in a mask who's kind of like very you know straggle and like looks they just give you a weird feeling where before covid nobody would pay attention to that now it's kind of like uh okay and it doesn't feel and um yeah the i I don't know it's just it's definitely an eerie it's hard to explain it's just an eerie feeling a lot of people have fled the city and have gone back to their original home state my my, i have to say my original home state is connecticut but i've been here since i was 18 so i I'm definitely a New Yorker and Connecticut's only an hour and a half, not even outside of the city. So, but, and, you know, I primarily live here, but yeah. So I feel close to my family in that way, but 
it's um it's an eerier feeling it's a thicker energy and it's sad my neighborhood is very popular for like bars and like a youthful scene and restaurants and everything and stuff's like closed down mm. and you know you don't have the bu- it's, it's winter too but it yeah it's just a thicker energy than it ever has been before so i am interested to see how it's going to make a comeback um yeah i get that i get that mm-hmm. i mean i think it will take some time um funnily enough we were talking about joe rogan earlier i remember uh he, he's just interviewed the undertaker which for me is like oh my god oh my god but they, yeah, they were yeah. actually talking about covid real briefly and uh joe rogan said something about you know potentially it could take up to like five years for things to return to normal and uh right. they were kind of saying back and forth like who, who knows like maybe it will be a gradual thing maybe it'll be everyone go crazy i'm more inclined to think everyone will go crazy i mean i'll be honest yeah i'm not like the biggest party ever but being cooped in all the time like i just want to go sh- batshit crazy and, and yeah i think a lot of people do it's yeah. people are saying it's gonna be like the roaring 20s because that yeah. was what happened after the yeah the pandemic in 1918 so makes sense people are saying it's going to be very similar to that when this is over you know it's one thing that's really cool about that as well is that the 20s was a big kind of uh movement as far as like you know women's fashion and fashion in general society like for example like it was i can only think of like women as being the main example here but like classically you'd never see a woman with a skirt any longer than you know part you would like you wouldn't even see her ankles kind of thing but then suddenly you started seeing women in in like uh in in short skirts and stuff which would have at the time been like mind-blowing like oh you can't do that like you know and and i find that element really cool i think we might see some real cultural shifts potentially as far as like i think so too yeah and that that's exciting to think about actually um Mm -hmm. there's something to look forward to i suppose (laughs) yeah um since we're still on, on the on the topic of covid um how has new york sort of reacted to the pandemic in general um and before we get into that question, I just want to add as well, what you were saying with regards to not feeling comfortable around certain people. There's a lot of people that have said that like, whether or not you wear a mask, particularly in the States, uh, kind of gives away your political leanings. And it sort of seems like, yeah, if you're a uh, Republican, you tend not to wear a mask. And if you're, is that right? Yeah. And then if you're a Democrat, you will wear a mask. So basically, if you're on the right, probably not going to wear a mask if you're on the left probably will and um you know it doesn't have to even necessarily be politics i think a lot of the time it's just if you're sensible you're going to wear a mask if you're not yeah um but like i guess real really what my point is is like do you have you noticed any sort of like massive changes in behavior other than the ones you sort of laid out earlier anything particularly crazy or um you know, is New York overall reacting well or, or negatively? Like, how is New York? I, th- I think in general, New York is is behaving well for the most part. I can only really speak to the city aspect of it. You know, yeah. we used to do a thing. I know I don't know if this was country or or national. I think this was just in the states, but we used to do a thing at seven p.m. where everybody would come to their window and bang pots and pans or scream and yell, and we would do it for to like cheer on the essential workers. Yeah, that was that. something that you guys did that too. It felt really good to do that. It felt like oh my god, everybody just need and really. I heard Sarah Silverman say this. I was watching an episode of Howard Stern that she was on and she was saying how, you know, it's really all of us just like animalistically screaming, like, get me out of this cage. But we are doing it in um in a way that's, you know, we're just releasing. And there was one night my brother and I were going for a walk over the summer at about seven o'clock and we walked past Mount Sinai Hospital, which had a literal truck full of dead bodies behind it oh, with shit, a, with an air con- yeah an air conditioner behind it keeping them cool and it was just a massive massive truck just they were just putting bodies in and we happened to be walking past the hospital at 7 p.m and there were uh some of the the frontline medical workers had stepped outside and the whole street the cars the pedestrians we all just stood and clapped for them that that was a really memorable moment um, but it was, it was pretty horrible from, from March till about mid-May. 
my street is already extremely noisy. I live near two highway entrances. I live near the subway and I live on a one way. So by right by the red light. So it's a huge intersection. So it's, I'm constantly hearing horns honking, beeping, just loud noises, trucks, everything, uh, police. I live around the corner from a police station, a fire station. So, <laughs> so it, it's, it's good and bad, <laughs> you know, well, being, I, on- I think if I, if I was living in New York and I lived near a police station, that, that would be a benefit. That'd be a positive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's all right. I mean, you know, obviously you probably have heard some of the, you know, the United States police, force is not uh i mean they sit here and they guard a christopher columbus statue 24 hours a day it's like so that people don't knock it down it's like why don't you guard people and stop worrying about the christopher columbus statue but anyway it's it's very loud here and uh when covid was at its peak here it was sirens every five minutes Mm. it was just nauseating you're just emergency after emergency for two months straight so you can't become numb to it, kind of. How do you how do you put up with that? Like, how do you sleep when there's just constant noise all the time? <laughs> um, o- over the summer, over the summer, I would have my air, my air conditioners in, and so you can't really hear it with the air conditioner. Okay. And then um, before before that, and now I'm truly like you get used to it. You do get you. I mean, occasionally there is like the horn because I'm facing the street. Occasionally there's a horn that will jolt you and wake you up. But uh, I, I, it is something that you have to get used to. And then mm. once you're used to it, it's just background noise. It's you don't yeah, even notice it. I, I get that. I get that. Yeah, that's a true. Have, that's a true thing. Yeah. Yeah. If you have like a continuous noise that you can kind of like, mm-hmm. no. So, so some people even do that on purpose. They'll put on like a tumble dryer or like a mm-hmm. washing machine. Is, um, sleep (laughs) i more notice it and obviously i don't have any house guests now Mm. because of covid we're very we have one friend who lives alone who's been a part of our pod since uh since may the end of may he's the only person we let upstairs but other than that in the random moments where i have had people over Mm. they'll say something they'll be like wow it's so loud here And, and you're like yeah get used to it I suppose you have to really, don't you? Yeah. What makes the perfect night out? I would say the perfect night out is everybody in the group maybe hanging beforehand. Maybe you do a dinner beforehand or you, Hmm. you know, pregame at someone's apartment, listen to some music um, and everybody's attitude to be willing to go out and willing to have a good time makes a huge difference. And I usually associate with my, myself with uh, my close friends usually are the group that's down to do things. So I would say a perfect night out is a little bit of like pre-gaming, listening to music, catching up, everybody catching up on the week and then going out and just whether it be dancing all night or, you know, going to a bar and bar hopping, just good company positive attitudes and willing to say yes to whatever the night brings that always is a good recipe for a great night out i just had to ask because like you know you, you when, when i saw this podcast for the first time i figured because i didn't know that you know you're a comedian or this other stuff uh-huh. and i just figured you're a person that likes to party which is fr- fine true. you know and i like <laughs> like i said i like the concept and stuff um and i you know I think I've learned through the course of looking at the podcast and, and learning about you that it's it's much more than that. But um, yeah, everyone has a different idea of what makes a good night out, and I think yeah. you yeah you hit on some really good points there. Like, you know, if someone's not willing, like oh my god, does that become a drag? You know, and it does depend. Yeah. Everyone has like a bad day, but like there are some people who just complain. Like I think there's a word like malcontents. I, yeah. I can't stand those people because their energy is they just they're off and it, it just ruins the night you know what i mean you just have to no get away fun, from it. yeah 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 i don't usually hang out with people who are no fun or if I <laughs> hang out with- <laughs> well naturally yeah <laughs> <laughs> if 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 someone who is maybe a little lower energy mm. me and the people i associate myself with we're usually able to drag the fun out of most people and if right. if I, if i'm hanging out with someone who's content on not having a good time then uh that's very rare <laughs> 
I like this question. I've started asking my guests this recently yeah. and um, it always gets a different response. What's the biggest life lesson you've learned so far? Oof. I mean, I, I think I have an amalgamation of things, mm. but one thing is think before you speak. You can't take words back. Yeah. So, and they, words words have a huge impact um so you think before you speak because you could really hurt someone um I would also say nobody's going to do anything for you even if you have the most supportive family even if you have the biggest which I do I'm an incredibly supportive family I have an incredibly supportive friend group I'm very very lucky for that none of those people are going to make anything happen for me unless I make something happen for myself. So that, and I think that goes with anyone, even if you have the most supportive team in the world, you have to wake up every day and say, what am I investing in my life? Mm. And how am I making my life move forward with my goals and my aspirations? Cause nobody else is waking, unless they're on your staff and you're paying them, nobody else is going to make your dreams come true. So you have to really put one foot in. So that's something I learned. And also, um, not to say you can't trust people, but be careful with what information you share with who, Yeah, you know, not everyone needs to know. I used to be a big oversharer. I used to, you know, meet somebody and then tell them my life story in one second. And that the thing that's, uh, you know, it's more special if you get to know someone friend, whoever it's, it's a lot more special if you get to know someone and gradually let them in rather than expecting to, you know, them to just take care of you if you tell them your whole life story. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I've learned yeah. to be a lot more reserved uh, over mm-hmm. the years with regards to that. Because there's nothing wrong with being open and and sharing unto yourself. But at the same time, yeah, people will manipulate you and, and try and use yeah. you and, and screw you over. And, and that's the problem. Like, you got you got to be aware of that and and remember that not everyone is your friend. <laughs> Absolutely. And because of the information you might share with someone, I remember going through a breakup, I would tend to latch on to other women who were going through breakups and right. we would be like you know, I would be spilling everything because I've exhausted all my other resources of people yeah. who want to listen to me going through this breakup. This was years ago, but I then I would cling on to women who were who were also going through a breakup and then I'd be spending my time with them and I'd be, you know, you know, we'd be talking, all we would do is talk about the breakup. And that is so it feels good at first. Cause you're like, this person gets me, this person relates to me, but then it, it's a toxic thing because you realize the only reason and the only thing that at the moment you guys have in common is your trauma. Yeah. And people have so much more to them, so many more layers to them than their trauma. So, you know, if I, in the future, if I'm going through a breakup or if I'm going through a hard time, I think I would learn to, you know, not just try to connect with somebody because they've also tried to go through that hard time, try to connect with them on a different level, because I don't think that's a good ground for a friendship. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. As we draw things to a close for today, mm-hmm. do you have any upcoming projects or maybe some final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? My upcoming projects are to grow the podcast, to continue to be consistent. My episodes come out every Monday at noon Eastern Standard Time in the States. Um, so I'm going to do my best and put 100% into that to keep those consistent and just lay low and be patient with the uh, healing post pandemic. You know, everybody, everybody's, yeah. I said to a friend the other day, this chapter of the pandemic feels different. It feels mm. like, like we're all this adapting to it a little bit more. And that's kind of eerie and icky, but to just roll with the punches and, you know, keep trying to stay positive. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for, for doing this. It's been an absolute oh, pleasure. Really I loved fun. speaking with you, Christian. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. This was a great way to start the day. I know it's a little later there, but for me, this was an amazing way to start the day. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. To my audience, make sure you go and follow Rocky Powell. Once again, that's the Wild Nights with Rocky Powell podcast. And um, 
yeah thank you very much for listening to the podcast um woo, we got to 60 episodes so i'm very very happy Yay, about that congratulations <laughs> thank you and uh yeah if you're not already uh on youtube make sure to like share and subscribe if you're listening on spotify apple podcasts google podcasts wherever you listen to the christian reef podcast make sure you give us a good rating you like it whatever just uh spread the word you know because uh this podcast I feel it has legs <laughs> and uh, you know, it's not going to go anywhere without your support. So um, yeah, thank you very much for listening and until next time, peace out one love. I shall see you in the next one.